Hey there, YouTube. I, I don't know what I was thinking of just doing. Anyway. <laughs> it, it's It's been a long time. Been a long, long time. But anyway, I just want to go ahead and get this out of the way here. Hello there, YouTube. It is I, Uncle John, back in the flesh yet again. And today... I'm going to be reacting to some videos, or video, now, not plural, but today we're going to go ahead and react to five creepiest sounds of war ever recorded, ever recorded. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. V-1 buzz bomb. The V-1 flying bomb was an early cruise missile developed by the German Third Reich Luftwaffe, its air force, created under a project code named Cherry Stone as part of a weapon series aptly titled Vengeance Weapons. Or One moment. First thing I'd like to go ahead and say here real quick, uh, before going further into this, I absolutely love their, uh, the narrator's voice for this. I love it. Voices, to me, so unique. Let's carry on. Or V-weapons. These were intended for strategic terror bombings to instill fear in the hearts of civilians. The V-1s were launched towards the UK in spots where Allied forces grouped starting in 1942. During the height of the war, around a hundred of these terrifying planes were being deployed per day towards England. The V-1 was powered by an Argus Pulse. I will say here real quick, and I've noticed this already, those two ball-shaped looking things inside of the plane, I swear to you, looks like a ball of yarn, or two balls of yarn, should I say. Pulse jet engine, the only mass-produced manned aircraft to use such a system that pulsed 50 times per second and generated an ominous noise, a terrifying buzzing that colloquially baptized the V-1, the buzz bomb, or the doodle bug. I'm not sure if I would go with, um, like, terrifying in a way. It is creepy, nonetheless, but I, I just, I don't know. I, I wouldn't really put it down as what he said, terrifying, unless he didn't say terrifying, that I just heard nothing <laughs> out of the blue. Oh, boy. It is said that this sound caused considerable psychological distress, as targets could hear the noise but not know where the bombs would land. I can believe especially it. Especially when several V-1s were simultaneously present. Due to the short range of the engine type, most of the V-1 flying bombs headed to the UK needed to be launched from neighboring France or the coastal regions of the Netherlands. By the end of the war, over 10,000 V-1s had been launched towards Britain at speeds up to 400 miles per hour, 640 kilometers per hour, and at altitudes up to 3,000 feet, these attacks decreased as the Allies took back the launching ports from the Third Reich, ending attacks on the English in 1944. Among countermeasures was the use of Hawker Tempests to intercept the bombs. Rather than shooting the V-1s and risking a mid-air explosion, the planes would approach to within 6 inches 15 centimeters, to induce an aerodynamic flip. The difference in air pressure above the plane's wing would disrupt the airflow over the V-1 surface and send it crashing before it reached a populated area. The last V-1 launching hmm. port was reclaimed by the Allies in March of 1945 in the Low Countries. Operation Wandering Soul. That sounds a little Operation creepy. Operation Wandering Soul was a U.S. propaganda and psychological warfare campaign against the Viet Cong. Just Viet by the name of this part here, Operation Wandering Soul. I really have no idea what that's about. Launched during the Vietnam War, the operation was inspired by Project Ghost Army a tactic used in World War II by the Allied forces where they would play recordings of moving Sherman tanks so that the Wehrmacht oh. would be fooled into believing that more tanks were present than there actually were. I've operation heard of something like that before. Was developed by the 6th Psychological Operations Battalion, or 6th PSYOP, of the U.S. 
The Navy was charged with the actual execution from speakers mounted on swift boats and helicopters. I, I've I've heard of this uh, this one here, not this thing in particular, but I have heard of uh, something being done like this before. I can't remember if it was in Vietnam or whatever uh, country it was in, but um, uh, some some uh, group of soldiers had recorded uh, sounds from. Uh, their buddies within the platoon and they would have them on loudspeakers to really give off this subtle uh, ghostly type moan if you will to to kind of give the enemy the thought that their dead buddy or loved one was out there completely stranded and they were looking for them I mean it was perfectly executed but this is exactly what that sounds like U.S. soldiers broadcast an unsettling soundtrack titled Ghost Tape No. 10 with supernatural sounds, funeral music, mournful wailing, and altered voices from the afterlife. Yeah, that was the one. Okay, okay. The imagined ghosts implored the Viet Cong soldiers to surrender and go home, lest their souls meet a similar fate. South Vietnamese participants helped the U.S. record haunting messages such as, quote, Don't end up like me. Go home, friends, before it's too late. That was the one I heard. Oh, this was the thing I heard. I'm not going to lie, but uh, it, I don't think it was from this channel. It was from another channel that was playing something like this and uh, similar. It could have been this channel. I can't remember. But I heard... Uh, sounds like this before uh, and it, it it's really eerie I love it it's horrific but it's very eerie I don't <laughs> I don't <rec> I don't recall hearing moaning in this one The recording sought to exploit the Vietnamese beliefs about death and spirituality by instilling fear that the souls of the lost soldiers were now aimlessly wandering the jungle. I had a feeling it was the Vietnamese. Okay, did I pronounce that wrong? Probably did. I don't know. But yeah, th this whole story I've heard before. But um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to know this kind of stuff. This targeted the belief that the dead must be buried in their homes, surrounded by friends and family, or bad fortune will follow, and that the deceased must be buried properly in their homeland, or their soul will wander aimlessly. While the United States might have successfully spooked some members of the Viet Cong, it's difficult to address the effects of the campaign, since those who responded to the recording usually met enemy fire. In some cases, the Vietnamese recognized the hoax for what it was, and actually shot in the direction at helicopters and boats carrying the speakers. Wait, wait, wait. It sounded like he was saying they were... Uh, did he say that... Uh, the, I was trying to really pay attention to this. But it sounded like he said that they were exposed. That they that the Vietnamese actually looked up and they're like, Oh, that's where the sound was coming from. Jericho trumpets. Um, my Jericho trumpets. Mounted on the U-87B dive bomber, Jericho trumpets with the propaganda symbol of German air might. The U-87B dive bomber, Is this what I think it is? Stuka, ...was being produced at a rate of 60 a month, making a total of 336 planes by the time the Second World War broke out. The propeller-driven sirens on the U-87B had a diameter of 2.3 feet, 0.7 meters, and produced a piercing wail that was used to pummel enemy morale and enhance the intimidation of bombing runs despite creating 20 miles per hour, 25 kilometers per hour of drag. Alternatively, some bombs themselves had an attached whistle that would sound upon release. Oh, whistle, okay. Historians debate whether the idea of including these trumpets came from Luftwaffe Colonel General Udet or from Hitler himself. The U-87B played a crucial role in the successes of the Blitzkrieg warfare, whereby the Germans launched rapid attacks from a densely packed line of combined infantry and air support to create gaps in their enemy's lines of defense and complicate any defense with a constantly altered warfront. These trumpets became a symbol of terror for opponents of the Third Reich regime, intimidating as any war cry may be. Especially horrific was hearing these planes approach towns or cities packed with civilians. 
as the planes launched their strike, falling like lightning from the sky. This I'm is what people heard. I'm not too sure if that would be something I would be terrified of, like, say, currently right now. But probably back then, I probably would have been crapping my pants. The death whistles were named after the conquest of Canaan during the biblical battle of Jericho, recorded in the book of Joshua, detailing how Israelites blew triumphant trumpets around Canaan after bringing the walls of the city down. The Third Reich used the clamor of the Jericho trumpets much like some kings of Judah had used the story of the original battle as propaganda. The downside of these horrific trumpets was that they slowed the planes down, making them less mighty in the face of modern Allied aircraft. After the Battle of Britain in 1940, around 20% of the total U-87Bs had been destroyed, and the fear inspired by its trumpets had been replaced with a better understanding of how to defeat the planes. Atomic Bomb Curiously, survivors from near the Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bomb hypercenters did not note hearing the explosions. John Hersey's 1946 report for The New Yorker stated that there was a, quote, noiseless flash. Those further away, however, recalled being hit by a tremendous crack as the air expanded, followed by a groan from the earth that reverberated through their bones. A then third grader who saw the bomb explode, Kimura Yoshiro, said the following, quote, Everything turned yellow. It was like I'd looked right at the sun. Then there was a big sound a second or two later, and everything went dark. The sound, like a cannon going if off. If I'm correct, I think this is the exact same bomb that um, left a, uh, a shadowing imprint of someone's figure on um, some steps. I could be entirely wrong. Reaches those at a safe distance far later than the site of the explosion. This seemingly disjointed experience happens because light travels faster mm -hmm. than sound, and anyone close enough to hear an explosion at the exact time it happens would theoretically be obliterated by the blast. High-quality recordings of nuclear explosions with sound are a rare find. This unedited audio from the Upshot Not Hole Annie test is one of the only few publicly available of such an event, recorded in 1953 at the Nevada test site. A 16-kiloton atmospheric burst was broadcast nationally on live TV. Not gonna lie, that does sound very disturbing. If, if I'm going to be very honest on that, it's very disturbing. It's said that about an hour following the Hiroshima and Nagasaki explosions, the air was again cut by thunder that instead signaled a thick black rain. Hitler's voice. Ooh. Finally, the fifth creepiest sound of war is one that disturbs and chills hearts for its scarcity. In 1942, Adolf Hitler's natural speaking voice was secretly recorded during a private conversation in a rail car. It's one of the only recordings in existence of the Fuhrer using his normal, non-shouting voice. I'll be honest Hitler's with you with guys. I have never heard Hitler's voice uh, without him being up on a podium uh, talking uh, loudly towards all the Germans that were in the crowd listening to the propaganda. If, if this was like an actual uh, solemn recording of him talking, this will be the first. General Carl Gustav Emil For Mannerheim me at least. happened in secret. Hitler entered Finland with the excuse of congratulating Mannerheim for his birthday. Mannerheim received him at Amatra, not wanting to turn the visit into anything resembling an official state event. 
at the German's personal train, a sound engineer named Thor Dahmen was tasked with recording Hitler's official birthday message. Once that was done, he bravely continued to record for 11 minutes until the Führer's SS guards became aware that the microphone was still on. They suddenly threatened Dahmen and ordered the destruction of the tape. Instead, the tape was turned over to the Kustavi Kuna, the state's censorship office, and was made public a couple of years after 1957. At the meeting, Hitler launched into a rambling monologue where he expressed frank concerns about having underestimated the USSR's military mobilization and marveled at the country's crazy and immense armament of 35,000 tanks. He says of the USSR what many around the world had begun thinking of him, quote, Not gonna lie, those glasses are actually pretty awesome. We didn't know ourselves just how monstrous this powerful beast was. This is what his tranquil, chilling voice sounded like when it was away from oh, the Oh, here we go. He had a deep voice? I always assumed it was like, like, a bit higher up. Is... Are they playing a game here? Did they like distort this? It was rumored that during the meeting, Mannerheim refused Hitler's request for Finland's help against the USSR after deducing Hitler's weak position by lighting a cigar and receiving no rebuke, in spite of the Fuhrer's widely known objection to smoke. That sound is so distorted. Because I, I, I know what his voice sounded like when he was yelling but there's no way that could have been him no way i don't know what to really say wow that huh there was a couple of things that kind of got me a couple of them uh one of them was the atomic bomb and the other one was definitely Hitler's voice. And truth, uh, like, truthfully, I don't think that was really his voice because it was way too low and it definitely sounded very distorted to me. I mean, if it was truly his voice, I will be very surprised. But that's just my opinion, at least. So that's going to be it for today's reaction video. Let me know what you think. Uh, Honestly, it's been a long time since I've done a video like this. So, yeah. All my stuff is down in the description box down below. Go ahead and check it out. I got a podcast, Uncle John Podcast, links to all that stuff. Like I said, down in the description box down below. And until then, I will see you all next time. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye for now.